let's depart from these thought experiments and examine a real-world experiment that doesn't involve rockets and closed rooms. Imagine you take a ball and drop it from a great height. When it hits the ground, it will have acquired energy from its fall, specifically mgh, where m is the mass of the ball, g is the Earth's gravitational acceleration, and h is the distance fallen. If you add this energy to the rest mass energy of the ball, mc squared, you get the total energy of the ball as it's fallen. Now, let's say we have a magic box that transforms all the energy of the ball, rest and kinetic energy from the fall, into a single photon with an energy h nu, which then rises back towards where the ball came from. A receiver magic box at the top of the tower then converts all of this photon's energy into the rest mass of a new ball, and this new ball has more rest mass because it has acquired that new energy from the fall MGH. So now, if you put this in a loop, you'd have a perfect perpetual motion machine. And since we never really liked the idea of getting something for nothing or your kicks for free and find the perpetual motion generally bad, the best we should be able to hope for is the simple recovery of the original ball with mass m and rest energy mc squared. This means that the energy of the photon received at the top h nu tick must be less than what it had when it was created at the bottom. This energy loss from bottom to top is roughly gh over c squared. This was Einstein's original reasoning that led him to know that there must be some kind of energy loss as photons rise out of a gravitational field. This is an excellent example of the Einstein equivalence principle at work because it explicitly uses the electromagnetic radiation in a lab setting rather than just masses freely falling. Then came along the Mossbauer effect. In 1958, Rudolf Mossbauer, while spectroscopically analyzing a gamma-ray nuclear transition of iridium-191, discovered that if he cooled the emitter down to 90 Kelvin, then the nuclei would not recoil when they emitted such high-energy photons. This recoilless gamma emission allowed another iridium-191 nucleus in a distant detector to absorb the photon in a resonant manner, completely absorbing the photon into the nucleus and going into an excited state. This had never been observed before because the recoil is usually so large that the gamma ray is Doppler shifted on emission to be the completely wrong energy to excite a distant iridium-191 nucleus out of its ground or unexcited state. With this process, if you wanted to check for the absorption at a frequency just a little bit higher or lower than the resonance, then you have to find some way of moving the detector either towards or away from the source at a speed that would make a Doppler effect to the desired amount. In 1959, Harvard's Robert Pound and his graduate student Glenn Rebka devised a plan to use the Mossbauer effect to measure the very tiny gravitational redshift that should occur as a photon rose up 22.6 meters from the bottom of a tower to the top. To get this Doppler shift, they used an audio speaker magnet to vibrate a sheet covered in a material that could receive the photon. Many materials were shown to be able to do recoilless gamma emission by this time, so Pounded Rebka chose Iron 57. It was easy to use and didn't have to be cryogenically cooled. By 1960, they were able to measure this very tiny shift, 5.1 times 10 to the minus 15th, thus proving the Einstein equivalence principle. In 1964, Pound and his colleague Snyder made great experimental improvements, raising the precision from two decimal places to 70 parts in a million. Here, we see that the formula shows how small that shift should be. 9.8 meters per second squared times 22.6 meters divided by 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 15th. This begs the question, is there a setup on Earth where the redshift will not occur? That is, can we use a special relativistic Lorentz inertial frame on Earth? Let's see if we can find such a frame. First, let's pretend initially that one does in fact exist. To help us, we use a special relativistic space-time diagram. Time ticks going up the vertical axis, space is going higher to the right. That's normal for space-time diagrams, don't fret it. What we really want to know though is, could there be any frame where the frequency does not change? Here, we're assuming that in this diagram, we found one. So let's see how that works out. When the photon is emitted, it's a packet of waves or a wavelet. It will have crests of the waves inside of a single photon. 
There will then be some tiny interval of time between successive crests of the photon's wave packet. In such a frame, as the photon rises up to the top of the tower, left to right in this diagram, gravity could be doing any old thing. But the first wave crest travels the lower green line, and the second wave crest travels the top one. Now, as the photon rises along the way, gravity might do something to it. But gravity is not time variant along this path. Therefore, both paths will be affected in the same way on the same trip. The green lines are made deliberately goofy because we don't want to make any assumptions of what gravity might look like in this region. But both wave crests will feel it identically in our putative at rest reference frame. Therefore, when the photon goes to the top in the no redshift Lorentz frame, the tiny time changes between the crests will not change. However, from both the heuristic arguments and Pound, Repka, and Snyder's work, we see conclusively that the frequency shift up to the top of the tower means that the wave crests have spread out and that the delta t's must change. Therefore, special relativity and Lorentz frames do not apply to the Earth or to any location with a uniform gravitational field. They also don't work if we take into account tidal forces from non-uniform fields. We could do better than a little diagram to demonstrate this mathematically. Using the standard Lorentz transformation of special relativity that I discussed at length in the previous lecture, we can derive the time difference due to transforming from one frame to another moving frame with some constant velocity relative to the original frame. We see at the end that the Lorentz transformation depends on some constant speed to give the difference in the passage of time as measured by clocks in different frames. However, the pound repka experiment shows that the time difference depends on the height in a constant gravitational field. This means every little height difference would need to be represented by a different Lorentz transformation with a different speed. We're now stuck. We can't just find one Lorentz frame to do it all for the Earth. We have to find a different one for every tiny bit of height difference. What a mess! Okay, so if we can't have a constant velocity frame, what if we created a frame that exhibited a constant acceleration? If we abandon inertial frames and just use some non-inertial accelerated falling frame, then maybe we can do it. And that's what I'm trying to represent by these falling boxes. It's not that one box is the frame, but rather that the reference frame itself is under constant acceleration at a given point. This also helps us remember that reference frames can be simple mathematical constructs that assist in greater understanding, and they don't have to be able to live in reality to be a correct description. Yeah, how would you actually make a frame that is continuously accelerating at a point such that you can put meters and clocks and reference frames in it? That'd be really hard considering that every other second the frame would be crashing into the, the ground on this particular example. Let's revisit the argument using Lorentz frames, but this time we'll allow the speed of the frame to increase with time. The falling frame starts at zero speed, with the falling frame and the tower to be matched up. The photon starts at zero height and will go up to height h. It'll take h divided by c for the photon to get there, and that'll be the time t that we want to know about. When the photon gets up to h, the frame speed will have increased by g times the time it took for the photon to rise up to height h. Amazingly, comparing the time as measured in the falling frame, t tick, to the time in the tower frame, t, we find that from the standard Lorentz transformation for that moment at that one speed to give a longer t tick. We can remember that frequencies are inversely proportional to time intervals, so new sub tick is the frequency measured in the falling non-inertial frame, and new is the frequency as received at the top of the tower. We can mix in the top equation for new received. We then find that the downward speed of the non-inertial frame creates a Doppler blue shift, 1 plus gh over c squared, that exactly cancels out the energy loss due to its rising out of a gravitational field. This last approximation arises because that ratio in front of new emit is like 1 minus g squared h squared over c to the fourth. This is what we call a second order effect. Now the first order effect is small, 10 to the minus 15th, so the second order effect would be about 10 to the minus 30th, so we can safely ignore that as completely unmeasurable. 
Therefore, we conclude that all effects of gravity on all laws of physics are removed in a freely falling frame. Or, much more specifically, that the pound Rebka experiment, to the best of its capability, cannot detect any violation of the assertion of the Einstein equivalence principle's local positional invariance. It's obviously not a test of local Lorentz invariance. We'll chat about more of these tests later.